I now have the great honor to introduce our keynote speaker and acknowledge her willingness to join us at this symposium to tackle the hard issues and to listen to the views of all stakeholders. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Minister for Maori Development and Local Government, the Honorable Nanaya Mahuta. He honore, he kroria, he maunga rungo ki te mata o te whenua, he whakaro pai ki ngā tāngata katoa. Arohaina ngā teina me ngā tuakane i raro i te tuanui o te nei whare, pai mariri ki a tātou katoa. Thank you for the invitation uh, to take part in this important conversation regarding the future of waters infrastructure and service delivery in New Zealand. I want to acknowledge the Chair, uh, Peter Brockie, as well as CE Stephen Selwood, uh, and staff for putting together the program for this symposium. I know that our Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern, colleagues Grant Robertson, Phil Twyford, Shane Jones are all making contributions over the next two days. Our participation reflects the close alignment of our government's priorities around infrastructure, whether that is related to water, housing, transport, regional development, economic growth or climate change. We regard this sector as critical to achieving our national objectives. The expertise and leadership represented in this room intersects with my portfolio, my local government portfolio, to consider a strategic approach to the way in which drinking, waste and stormwater services are delivered and regulated with improved social, environmental and economic benefits to society. This is the government's Three Waters Review that I'm leading. The symposium programme with challenged conversations such as lifting vision, creating value, thought leadership, infrastructure as a foundation for national development, providing for growth, bridging the funding gap, uh, all informs, oh, and regional development informs and intersects with our Three Waters Review. Our government sees water as a foundational infrastructure. As a nation, our health depends on a supply of clean, safe drinking Water. Our environment suffers when wastewater is not well treated. We cannot build higher housing in high growth areas or revitalise regional centres if we don't have the ability to fund and build the necessary water related infrastructure. Our valuable tourism industry suffers badly when we struggle to respond to infrastructure challenges associated with rising visitor numbers. Indeed, climate change and building resilience against natural disaster only add to the scale of the challenge. And we need infrastructure that bears the impact of climate change effects now. With the Three Waters Review, we aim to have our water system provide safe, clean water, improve our freshwater and environmental objectives, and deliver multiple benefits, including cost efficiencies to ratepayers and consumers. We see water as critical. Our national aspirations depend on it. Community expectations and regulatory requirements add to the need for change. It has become apparent that the status quo just isn't sustainable. Things must change. We have a senior group of ministers that are working hard around this topic. <clears throat> and we've begun to uncover and reveal the scale of the challenge. We are engaging with local, the local government sector, stakeholders about water reform and water interests. We're beginning to extend that con conversation across the country, including with interested parties, also iwi and Māori. For too long we've taken for granted this precious and finite resource. But the main challenge, challenges relate to regulation, funding, capacity and capability, service delivery rising to the challenge of finding a solution to minimise long-term exposure to risk of not doing anything at all. A big picture is emerging of regulatory shortcomings in different parts of the Three Waters system. The Havelock North can back the water contamination tra tragedy was a wake-up call. More than 5,000 people became ill and up to four people are believed to have died from associated causes. In relation to drinking water safety, the Havelock North Inquiry identified a widespread systemic failure among water suppliers 
to meet the high standards required to the, for the supply of safe drinking water to the public. Key recommendations included a dedicated water regulator and dedicated and aggregated water suppliers. <coughs> Taking together, the inquiry's recommendations amount to a step change in the way that drinking water is supplied and regulated in this country. The government is working through these issues associated with the recommendations. The Ministry of Health's latest drinking water standards update shows that in too many parts of the country, particularly with smaller supplies, compliance with drinking water standards by registered suppliers is unacceptably low. Across all supplies, almost 20% of people are exposed to water that does, does not meet all safety standards. In terms of the environment, a draft report on wastewater commissioned by DIA has found that there are many, many concernably low levels of compliance against current regulatory settings. It is clear that the national policy statement for freshwater management comes into effect. The significant rise in standards required will impact most heavily on small towns, and this is a concern for me as local government minister. Then there is the question of economic regulation. Many ratepayers would struggle to know what they are paying for, for their water services, how to know whether they're getting safe, high quality water, whether the service is value for money, and whether their provider is making sensible water related investments. Under the current system, the information is simply not available. To achieve the outcomes we're seeking, we will need to strengthen our regulatory regime so that we have high standards and effective compliance monitoring, reporting and enforcement for safer drinking water, better environmental performance, and the ability to meet efficiency objectives and consumer expectations, including cost. What this regime might look like and the potential options for change are part of the work officials are now progressing. And I see that Richard Ward is on later on after this presentation to answer some of that. Our Three Waters system faces significant funding challenges. A Becker report commissioned again by DIA found the costs of upgrading drinking water infrastructure to meet key recommendations made by the Havelock North Inquiry is in the region of 500 million and thought to be more like double that by some industry leaders. The draft report on wastewater infrastructure costs to meet the NPS freshwater criteria indicates upgrade costs may exceed two billion. This does not include discharge to marine and coastal environments or replacement of ageing underground pipes. So that figure may be conservative. Added to this, there is acceptance by industry leaders that significant reduction of sewage outflows is the single biggest challenge facing the wastewater system in terms of infrastructure and funding. When we begin to look at stormwater and meeting the challenges of sewage overflows, the anecdotal feedback is that this raises costs onto another level altogether. When these are considered with future population growth and climate change challenges, it further compounds uh, the funding challenges faced by the local government sector. As you can see, the proposition for change, while not simply an economic one, has merit. Given the interconnected nature of our water systems, it's difficult to see how we can meet future regulatory requirements and consumer expectations without also making changes to service delivery arrangements, including infrastructure provision. So while fixing the regulatory arrangements for water is a priority, we also need to look at how we consider water service delivery to be able to fund infrastructure. How do we manage the high growth in areas such of the Golden Triangle of Auckland, my hometown, Hamilton and Tauranga, for example? And at the opposite end of the spectrum, how do we manage those areas with declining populations and growing service delivery and infrastructure challenges? They shouldn't have to rely on Lotto to fund their infrastructure. I'm well aware of the debt level restrictions that inhibit some council's ability to fund new infrastructure. These are matters we are currently working through. As a government, we are committed to the continued public ownership of existing water infrastructure assets. This is the bottom line. But we don't see it as, as a conflict between public ownership and the ability to structure water services in such a way as to finance and deliver necessary infrastructure. Our firm view as a government 
is that the funding issue can be addressed within the public ownership model. Some councils have kept abreast of water infrastructure investments and should be recognised for that. Others have not. The impost on some smaller provincial councils, particularly those with declining rate payer bases, to meet safety standards, consumer expectations, environmental performance and realistic affordable costs starts to look very challenging under the current system. Many communities struggle to attract and retain specialist technical skills necessary to run water infrastructure and manage assets. Those of you who work on the ground delivering these skills to keep our essential infrastructure up and running are well aware of the scale of the challenge and also its inherent complexities. My recent trip to England, Scotland and Ireland provided useful insights into how other countries have approached their water-related challenges. I'd like to acknowledge the work done by Infrastructure New Zealand on looking at the Scottish infrastructure models in its report, Building National Infrastructure Capability, Lessons from Scotland, in particular those concerned with water. My visit was instructive and I learnt what has worked well for them, what mistakes were made, and how this might influence our approach to water reform in New Zealand. But any options the government decides to progress must work for our circumstances, our context, and our communities. In general, as many of you know, the, in the United Kingdom and Ireland, they have much stronger regulation and more capable and better funded services independent drinking water and environmental regulation leading to safer drinking water and better environmental performance, economic regulation that provides a level of assurance that the right level of investment is being undertaken in the three waters, and economic regulation that drives a focus on customers and efficiencies. It is particularly instructive to note that, the Scottish, that Scottish water has achieved 40% savings and off wet in England achieved a 30% savings on their consumer water bills. <clears throat> this in part was, inform was a result of aggregation, procurement and reducing leakage over time. Reflecting on the water reform experience of those case studies, my view is that a strong coordinated regulatory regime will not be enough on its own to deliver all the outcomes we are seeking here in New Zealand. The costs of upgrading the system to meet expected standards will fall on already heavily burdened ratepayers and will take a very long time to accomplish. This is something we'll need to consider as we contemplate alternative options for service delivery here in New Zealand, as is the need for professional skilled directors in any new option. All this has to be balanced by the need to keep community involvement and oversight in any proposed options and our determination to maintain robust, healthy, democratic rep representation for our communities is essential. We believe that change in our three waters system to deliver safe drinking water and to ensure better environmental performance while making sure the bills are affordable for our communities is compatible with strong and involved local government. We also acknowledge that there is further work to do in this area. We expect progress on returning the full wellbeings to the Local Government Act and a renewed emphasis on placemaking. And this will contribute to the other part of the picture for the local government sector as we build on a solution. Our Three Waters Review involves two major pieces of work. Firstly, options for a dedicated water regulator and an enhanced regulatory regime. And secondly, options for water services capability funding, scale and professional governance. These are at the heart of a constructive conversation we are having with local government. And I would like to acknowledge the joint contributions of the infrastructure, water and engineering sectors towards this conversation. And note Infrastructure New Zealand, Water New Zealand and Engineering New Zealand's joint letter to myself and my colleagues, Minister of Health and the Minister for Environment in March this year on these very matters. In terms of the way forward, I am to have options for changes to three waters before Cabinet later this year, with decisions on a regulator taken in 2019. Related service delivery options may take a little longer to settle, to settle on. Uh, there's a lot of uh, tension uh, in the local government sector about this question, as you would imagine. But further work beyond 2019 is anticipated. Our government is determined to put the water system on a better footing. 
our economy, our environment, our communities, and the, healthy and, product and the healthy and productive society that we all aspire to depend on it. The challenges are too big for any of us to achieve alone. We need to come up with the optimal solutions. I know that there is a wealth of experience and expertise here today. Thank you all again for your participation in this session. The opportunity to work together is in front of us. The case for change in my mind is compelling, putting people and the communities at the forefront of the Three Waters work will again, in my mind, get us to a different place with better outcomes. The government welcomes your input and feedback into this work program and your leadership uh, within your sector and across communities will be critical as we build public support for this approach. For a nation to, su to survive and strive to be relevant to communities, we must engage people. Nō reira heti, nō ataku, ka tino mihi atura The analogy of water was used, Clint, by yourself, and I'll use this particular analogy. He waka eke noa. A waka reaches its de destination, which implies when you navigate well, you'll get through any storm. And in this instance, you cannot stop an idea whose time it has come. We do need serious reform in the water space, and for the part that I'm playing, I'm intending to take that, for uh, that forward. Tēnā tata katoa.